In keeping with the tradition of Rosh Hashanah, I want to begin with a confession. When I was a kid many years ago, I was different. I was exceptionally different. I was, how can I say this? I was weird. When other kids would come home from school and they, they'd play basketball or go out to play tag, I would pretty much stay alone in my room and wherever I could, I would go out into the woods around our house and I would wander. I wasn't afraid and I don't know why, perhaps my relationship with my Yiddish speaking grandparents, but I particularly enjoyed having conversations with God. I didn't think about it too much and I didn't even ask for too much. I was a fat kid, but I didn't ask to be thin. I was dyslexic. I was terrible in school, but I didn't ask to be smart. I was awful at sports, but I didn't ask to play third base for the Yankees. Well, maybe once. No, my conversations with God went something like this. What do you want from me? I'm here to serve you, but just tell me how I'm supposed to do that. And until that time, please give me the tools to make me a wiser, kinder, and more moral person. Help me to be more like you. And that was it. That was the entirety of my conversations with God. Now, I can't say he ever answered me, at least not verbally, nor did I expect him to. But let's just say he answered me in other ways, in all ways, and I have no complaints. It's because of that, many years later, as an adult, I began to have conversations with other peoples of faith, not just Jews, Christians, Muslims as well, and I began to hear about other types of conversations with God, other expectations. I would hear people say, in my house of worship, God supports gay marriage. Or I hear other people say, in my house of war worship, God is against gay marriage. I could hear people say, where I pray, God does not support Israel's settlements in the West Bank. Or I hear other people say, the God I pray to supports Israeli settlements in all of the land of Israel and supports the Zionist enterprise. Now, I'm listening to these conversations and I'm thinking, these are very different than the conversations I used to have with God. But more importantly, they are very different than the conversations that Jews have had with God for thousands of years, ever since the Jewish people pioneered this notion of one God and one moral universe. In fact, what I was hearing from many of my friends of different faiths reminded me less of that revolutionary idea of monotheism than it reminded me of the ancient idea of paganism. And I found myself calling it just that, neo-paganism. Now paganism, of course, was the belief that God, or more accurately the gods, resembled man. The gods had human weaknesses, they had appetites, human desires, they even looked like men and women. And then we came along, the Jews, but more accurately, God came to us. God came to Abraham. And what did he say? He said to Abraham, people around you practice human sacrifice, but you are not going to practice human sacrifice. God said to Abraham, people around you are envious of their neighbors. They are hostile to strangers. They're cruel to animals but you won't do all that. You won't steal, you won't murder, and you'll have no other gods before you. Not because doing all that is bad for society, but because doing that is bad, morally, period. God said to Abraham, you will be different. And Abraham said, Hineni, I'm here. I'm ready. And Abraham stood apart. We call him Abraham the first Hebrew. In Hebrew, Avraham Ha'ivri. Abraham, the man who crossed over. Abraham, 
the man who stood apart. But it wasn't enough that Abraham stood morally apart. God said to him, Lech lecha, leave your nice comfortable home in Ur and go to a land that I will show you. It's a distant land. It's a tough land. But it is a land that will seal the covenant between us. And Abraham said, Hineni. I'm here, he said. And Abraham crossed over, literally crossed over the Jordan River into the land of Israel. And there Abraham created a nation that stood apart. Physically, morally, spiritually, that nation stood apart. But it stood apart not like the pagans of the day in order to make God resemble that nation, but on the contrary, to make that nation more morally like God. God, Abraham and his nation set themselves apart, not for their own sake, but for the sake of the world, precisely in order to make that world a kinder, wiser, and more moral place. And Abraham succeeded. Over the course of the centuries, more than half of humanity followed Abraham's example and crossed over. Today though, even among those who still adhere to faith, it's common to ask not what God expects from me, but what I expect from God. And the answer frequently is, I expect the God who dwells in my house of worship to embrace my policies, my political agenda, to affirm and even sanctify my ideas. Hence the word neo-paganism. Neo-paganism is, is the religion in which the God I worship is essentially myself. Now neo-paganism is a challenge not only to religion, neo-paganism is a challenge to civilization. A neo-pagan is liable to ask, why should I fight for the next guy when he doesn't share my beliefs? Why should I stand up for the poor if the poor do not Share my principles. In a neo-pagan environment, like-minded communities get smaller and smaller, and the societies containing them become increasingly fragmented. Neo-pagan countries have great difficulty defending themselves because their citizens can't agree what they should be defending. And all, all along, the enemy that is fighting them knows all too well what it is fighting for, and what it is willing to die for. This is perhaps the greatest challenge of our day, reconnecting to that original idea that human beings are created in God's image and not vice versa, and that we serve God's agenda. God doesn't serve ours. And at precisely this time, there is once again a fateful role for the Jewish people and for our nation state the state of Israel. That is a state that emerged from centuries of discrimination, bloodshed, expulsions, culminating in the greatest mass massacre in human history. Now the survivors of all of that could have scattered, they could have gone elsewhere, they could have integrated into other societies. But like Abraham, many of them took themselves back to their ancestral homeland. That land had no resources, no water even. It was surrounded by enemies that yearned to destroy us. Yet Israel overcame all of those obstacles. We beat the odds. And today Israel is listed as one of the world's eight most powerful nations. In medicine, in computer science, in refugee absorption, in citizen longevity, and even citizen satisfaction, Israel is a global leader. Israel stood apart. Indeed, we often stood alone. But in doing so, we set an example for all of humanity. In a region deeply hostile to the very idea of democracy, Israel created one. And to this day, Israel remains one of the few countries in the world never to have known a second of non-democratic governance, and one of the few countries in the world never to have known a second of peace.
a few hours' drive from where hundreds of thousands of people have been massacred by ISIS and other radical organizations. A few hours' drive from Jerusalem. In the Knesset, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Druze openly and loudly debate all and every issue. Many peoples today, particularly in the West, are abandoning tradition. They see it as antithetical to modernity. But Israel has proven that tradition can coexist with modernity. Indeed, in Israel, the past and the future, they go hand in hand. Alongside great centers of Jewish learning are world-class universities. And whether we're discussing the Pauschata Shavua or rocket science, the language we use is the language with which we pray in synagogue. In Israel, where more than three quarters of the population defines itself as traditional in one way or the other, there are more high-tech startups than in all of Western Europe combined. More high-tech investment per capita than any other country in the world. We are the country that recycles more water, nearly 90%, than any country in the world. And we've practically eliminated the plague of drought. We are the country that exports wine to France, caviar to Russia, gluten-free pasta to Italy, and cherry tomatoes to the United States. And many modern societies today are unsure of how they can defend themselves, or even whether their nations are worth fighting for. I recently hosted a French parliamentary delegation, and the leaders of the delegation asked me with all seriousness, where are your troops? Because if you go to Paris today, you go to Brussels, it looks like an armed camp. But Tel Aviv? Tel Aviv looks like, you know, fun. Where are the troops? Our European friends have not yet figured out what Israel has long known, that a modern liberal society can morally, humanely stand up for itself and fight. And the Israel Defense Forces today are more than twice as large as the French and British armies combined. And in wartime, tens of thousands of Israeli reservists report for active duty. More reservists than are actually listed on the rosters and they report to fight for their country knowing full well that some of them will not come home. And in an age in which patriotism and altruism, Israel, which is regularly listed as the most patriotic country in the world, provides relief to the victims of disasters throughout the world. And in an era in which love of your land can appear incompatible with globalization, Israel remains committed to the land of Israel while rigorously reaching out to others. Yes, Israel faces attempts to boycott us, to sanction us, and we must take those threats seriously. Yet, as Israel's Deputy Minister for Diplomacy, I can tell you that our foreign relations today are in an incalculably better state than at any time in our national existence. Where we once stood alone, today dozens and dozens of countries are crossing over with us. Over the past